عرفت الله ربي أشرق النور بقلبي ما لقلب الشروح حياتي مل أضاء Once before we give our praise our thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the favors and bounties Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been told on us and we send salat and salam and islam and fan and messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Tonight, inshallah, we will start with Ayat 154. But before starting Ayat 154, just to refresh our memories, how we are going so far in this just From the beginning of the just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with talking about the changing of the Qibla from Bayt al-Maqadah to Masjid al-Haram. And after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 150, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after completing his talks about changing the Qibla from Bayt al Muqaddas to Masjid al Haram in Makkah, Allah says, Liyutimma ni'mati. The reason I have done that is so that I will be fulfilling or completing my favors on you. And immediately after that, in 151, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then compares it. He says, Kama arsalna fikum rasulam minkum. He says, Changing the Qibla was something big. Changing the Qibla was as a result of wanting to complete my favors on you. It is just like that also by sending my messenger is a means of completing my favors on you. So, and also it is by sending my messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it is, uh, it is accepting the dua of Ismail and Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam. He was comparing us to. And then after that he has said, فَذْكُرُونِ أَذْكُرُكُمْ Meaning that these two things which I've done for you, one is changing the Qibla, which is a great thing in your sight. The second thing is making Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the seal of all the Prophet, the best of all the Anbiya, the best of all the Messengers. And I've placed him amongst you and from a man from amongst yourself. So because of these two things now, these two great things that I've done for you, and not only them but all other favors, first Quruni, you need to remember me. Remember me because of these great favor which I have done to you. So that's why Allah beginning with fast, which is connected to the two things from before, the two topics that we were talking about before. So he says, Fatkuruni Askurukum. Remember me and I will remember you. And then he says, Washkuruli Walatakuru. Be grateful to me and do not be ungrateful. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after saying that he wants you to remember him. And after if you remember him, do not think that Allah wouldn't remember you. Allah says, I will remember you as well. So remember me for all that the favors that I have given you. Everything that I have given you, I want you just to remember me. And when you remember me, do not think that I only want you to remember me and I will not think about you. But know to yourself that I will also remember you. Then he says to be grateful and do not be ungrateful. But then how could we be grateful to Allah? For everything which Allah has given to us. Then Allah teaches us in another ayat, Ya ayu al-ladina amanu sa'inu bi sabri wa salat. The two things that which we could use to be grateful to Allah is patience and salat. Because in this life, many afflictions come our way. This life is not a life, an easy life, a life of only comfort and a life of only pleasure. At one scholar he mentioned that if this life was a life of only comfort, had no hardship, no difficulty, then Jannah would lose its value. Jannah would lose its value. Then what would we be striving for? If there is no hardship at all in this life, then what would we be striving for? Then this life would be similar to that of Jannah. But Allah has placed this life with those hardships so that Jannah will have such great value that we will want to strive for it. So Allah says you need to be patient whenever afflictions come your way. Whenever musibah and harms and difficulty come your way, you need to be patient. And also, when you are being patient, continue to pray to Allah to remove it. As well as when you are being favored as well. Not that only when you are you're in hardship you are going to remember Allah, but also when you are well, you need to pray to Allah and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because as one hadith mentions, that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever remembers Allah in the time of happiness and comfort, then Allah 
will remember him in a time of hardship and difficulty. Allah will recognize him. So if we are accustomed, when we are in good ease, we are in comfort, we always remember in Allah. We always think about Allah. That when we are in hardship, Allah will be familiar with our voice. Allah will be familiar with our calling. So at that time, Allah will answer us as well. And then after that, now tonight, the ayat we're going to do, which is verse 154, it comes immediately after Allah tells us to have patience and Allah tells us to pray. To pray our salah. Allah says, وَلَا تَكُولُوا لِمَنْ يُكْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَانِ Allah says, do not say to those who have been slain in the path of Allah, Amwa, they are dead. Do not say those people that fought in the path of Allah, that they are dead, they are not alive. But Allah says, Bal ahya, they are alive. Bal means certainly, definitely, ahya, they are alive. Wala killa tashburu, but you do not realize, you do not understand. So to connect these two ayats, the ayat before it is verse 153 and 154, Allah tells us to be patient and pray salat. But what is the greatest calamity could befall a human being? What brings the most sadness and the most grief to a human being? When we lose other human beings. When we lose those people that we love. So for example, if we, we lose our parents or our parents lose their children, that is very sad. And as human beings, it how old our parents might reach. Whenever they pass away, we will still feel it in our heart. So after Allah says to be patient, Allah tells us about the greatest hardship that could come our way, that is having to let go of those whom we love. So Allah talks about those who have gone and fight. And it is even, if it, it was even harder for when somebody goes out in a path of Allah because they wasn't sick. For example, a, a wife, she, her husband is so healthy and strong and he could be young as well and he goes out to fight and he never returns back home. How hard would that be to know that my husband was so strong, I was so healthy, and he has just went out to fight and he has never returned home. Sometimes some of the, those who used to fight were children. When we say children at the age of 17, 18 years old, mothers are at home, their sons who are only 17, 18 years old going out to fight and never returning back home. How hard was that? And that's why some of the Mufassirun, they say that this ayat was revealed in Medina, but it was revealed before the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was the fourth battle to be fought. There wasn't any battle before the Battle of Badr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preparing the Sahabas now, that soon you're going to fight. And when you're going to fight, if you lose someone, do not go back, on your, go back to your previous religion, but be patient and pray to Allah. And do not think that these people that have fought so hard that they have wasted their life. Do not think that I've lost, I've lost my son, I've lost my husband, I've lost my father. But know that they are better than where they was here. Because what I've given them because of what they have fought for in the path of Allah, I'm keeping them alive in the hereafter in Barzakh. They are always alive in Barzakh. And Allah says in another ayat, Allah says, Yurzakun. Not only are they alive, but they are being fed by Allah. Allah is sustaining them. So do not think that they are punishing and they are, they are suffering, but know that they are being blessed more than we are being blessed. So that's what Allah says, وَلَا تَكُولُ لِمَنْ يُكْتَلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتِ Do not say those who fought in the path of Allah, Amwa, they are dead, but ahya, but they are alive. Allah informs us here that the shuhada, the martyrs, they are in Barzakh and they are alive in Barzakh, Yuru Zakun, being sustained. As for how are they sustained, and as for how are they alive, some of us might want to think, how is it that these people are alive? What method are they in? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that for us in the ayat itself. He says, Wala killa tashuru. Allah says, you cannot understand it. No matter how hard we try, we could just, we could just try our best, but to have the true understanding of how they are alive, Allah says, you cannot understand it. Allah knows exactly what he's talking about, that they are alive and how they are alive. But in some hadith, in Sahih Muslim, it is mentioned, Inna al-arwahu shuhara fi hawasil al-suyur khadira. 
It says, verily, the souls of the Shohana, the souls of the martyrs, they are inside of green boards. The souls, when they come out from the body, they are in, inside of green boards. And they move around in Jannah however they want. So they are, the, souls are come, the souls would come out of their body and the souls would go into green boards in Jannah and the, the boards would fly around however they want. Then they will come towards the lamps and these lamps that they will come to These lamps are hanging under the arsh of Allah. They are hanging from the arsh of Allah to below the arsh of Allah. Says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look down and see the shuhadas because they will be in the form of birds. The soul will be in the form of birds. And he will look down and he will see them. And he will say, Mada tabgoon, what do you seek? What do you want? He will ask the shuhada, what do you want? Fakalu the shuhada, the martyrs, they will say, Ya Rabbuna wa ayyu shayin nabuki. Oh our Lord, what else could we ask for? What else should we want? Look at what and what you have given us already. What else should we ask for and what else should we seek? It says, ma lam ahda min You have given to us what you have not given to any other human being. That's what the shaheed and the martyrs will say. You have given to us what you have not given to anyone else. Summa ada alayhi bimisli hada. Then after some time Allah will ask them again. And when they will realize that Allah is asking them all the time, what do you want? Then they will say, Nuridu an nusuratuna ila darid dunya finuqatil fi sabidika hatta nafsal fika marratan ukra. They say, what we want is that you send us back to the dunya. And not to send us back to the dunya for us to live in the dunya, but send us back to the dunya for us to fight again in your path and die. We want to go and be a shaheed for the second time. And then we want to go again and be a shaheed for the third time because of the amount of favors you have given to the shaheed. <coughs> And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will say, Inni katabtu annahum ilayha la yarjihun. Bali, I have already written that they will not be able to return. So even though they desire to return, they will not be able to return. It's mentioned from Ka'ab bin Malik, that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the soul of the believers, not the shaheed, he said, the soul of the believer, ta'irun, they are in that of board, that feeds on the trees of Jannah. So the believers now, it is mentioned in this hand, is not only the shaheed, but it is also there for other believers as well. That when a true believer dies and he goes to Barzakh, his soul comes out and it goes into boards. And those boards fly around and they feed on the trees of Jannah until they return, until the, Umar, until the day of resurrection comes, and the day when everybody has to be gathered again, that is when they return to their body. But as while they're in Barzakh, the waiting period, and Barzakh means the waiting period. Barzakh is not a specific place. Sometimes when we hear Barzakh, we, we start to think of a special place. All those who have passed away is gathered at this special place. But Barzakh is the time, the time from when you die until Yom al Kiyama, that the soul traverses and the soul and the soul stays. The soul sometimes they are they will be at good places, for example in Jannah as is mentioned in this hadith, and there will be different levels in Jannah. And there will be in different animals, for example, in boards that is mentioned for the believers. So they will be there and they will wait and they will feed until it's time to, for resurrection and it will come back to their body. But Allah specifically mentions the Shaheed because of the great status of the Shaheed. Because a shaheed, when a shaheed and a martyr, he becomes a martyr, his body does not rot. His body does not become rotten, worms do not take over his body. As mentioned by some scholar, if for some reason somebody was to dig up somebody who fights in a part of Allah and see that his body has been decayed, then know that he is not really a martyr. Know that his, he was not really a martyr. He fought, but his intention may be wrong. Because when his intention is right, Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is right as well. If his intention is right, then definitely his body would not, would not start to decay. And even the Prophets, Alayhi Wasallam, all the Prophets, their bodies do not decay as well. 
The prophets, they go into their grave and their bodies are still the same way the day they die. And it is mentioned they, when they go to Barzakh, they are also even higher degree than that of the Shaheed. Allah mentions about the Shaheed, but the prophets are even greater and in higher ranks more than the Shaheed. And they are there waiting, they are alive as well, waiting. Even though they are alive in that world, they are not alive in this world. So you cannot say that the Prophet is alive here right now with me, or the Shaheed are alive in this world. Allah said they are alive, but they are alive in the next world. And that is why Prophet Shaheed, when he dies, he is treated as somebody who has passed away. Because you, you, recite, you, you pray the janaza for them. You do not beat them, but you perform the janaza. And all the, the earnings, are all the wealth that they have remaining, you have to distribute it among those who they left behind. So you still treat them as if they are dead, but Allah said they are alive in the next world, not really in this life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the next ayat, which is verse 155, it says, Now if somebody... Allah, after mentioning to be patient and pray Salat, he mentioned about the Shaheed, those who passed away, those who died while fighting. But sometimes we, we have other people might die from us, that other relatives or close family members die and they didn't fight in the path of Allah. At that time, we still need to have patience. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of other things that He will test us, not only with those who are Shaheed from amongst our family. But others who are lost to us, they are not shaheed and they have passed away, that is also a test for us. And Allah mentioned all the types of tests as well. He says, We will definitely test you with something of fear. We will definitely test you of something from fear, from hunger, from the decrease of wealth, and soul, and provision, and your sustenance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayat Allah says wala nablu wannakum hatta na'lamu mujahideen minkum as-sabirin Allah says we will definitely test you until we will know who are the true fighters and who those who are the true patient those who have true patience that is why we will test you to see who has the more patience and these tests Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give it to those whom he loves the more you are closer to Allah is the more Allah will test you the farther away from Allah is less test Allah will put on you and that is why the prophets had to go through greater tests than the ordinary people. And those who are closer to Allah, the wali Allah and the friends of Allah, they are tested even more than the ordinary people. So those who are closest to Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests them, not to punish them, but to see how strong is their iman. To see how much patience that individual can have. And if we really truly show our patience at that time, Allah will give us our reward. Allah will bestow all the blessings on us. So Allah says, you will test you from fear. Fear is something that is a test from Allah. Sometimes we fear different things. That fear that Allah placed in our hands, sometimes for enemies, sometimes for different things. Sometimes for the amount of crime we have. We fear for our life if I go out at such and such time. All of this is considered to be a test from Allah. Allah says, well, Jew, the other thing is Jew. Jew which means hunger. Hunger refers to poverty. Allah will make you poor. Allah remove wealth from you. And at that time when you are poor and you have no wealth, you do not know where the next meal is coming from. And many people, they will sell out their religion at this state. There are many Muslims even right in Trinidad, but they, they are so poor, they do not know where their next meal will come from. And as soon as some unbeliever come and give them a little hamper, they, they accept that religion, they go on and become Christian. So that is a means of test. Allah brings you to that state of poverty to see what you're going to do. And there's only two things to do. Either to persevere and be strong and hold on and stay with Allah and Allah will remove it from you. Or turn away from Allah and Allah will make it more difficult for you. And when we say Allah make it more difficult, in this life it might look as if Allah brings ease to you. You might look to yourself, you know what, I've changed my religion and everything's working good for me. So it is happening for the best, but Allah is actually making it worse for you because in the next life you have nothing to get. So Allah says, well, joy wa nafsim min al-amwal, and decrease of wealth. Sometimes you are in some business, 
And all of a sudden things don't go your way instead of profit you're getting lost and you want to know what is happening. Start to get frustrated. Allah says that is a test. Allah is testing you as well. Well anfus and here Allah says well anfus and life. Not shaheed but normal lives Allah will take those who are near to you. Allah will take your loved ones, those who you love a lot. Those who sometimes we think that we cannot live without them. And many people say that I cannot live without my wife, I cannot live without my children. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take it away from us, we still have to live without them. We still have to live. It will be sad, but we still have to live without them. And that is what Allah wants to test us, to see what we are going to do. We were saying before they die, we were saying I can't live without them. Allah wants to see, I have take them away from you. I want to see if you are going to live or you are not going to live. And for us to live at that time and be strong and say, you know what, they have gone back to Allah, Allah will recompense them, Allah will grant them Jannah. But if I am still alive, it is for me now to try to get Jannah. They have already gone. It is for me to try and strive for my Jannah. And Allah says, what Samarat? The other thing is Samarat. Samarat means the produce, gardens, farms, those things that you get wealth from. And so all of that is considered to be test. And he says, wa bashir is sabiri. And glad tidings to those who are patient. For Bashri the Sovereign give glad tidings to those who are patient. So whoever who was on, whoever is strong in their iman and their faith, when these tests come to them, Allah says, Your Bashri the Sovereign, we give glad tidings to them. That definitely Allah has greater things in store for them. Allah then says, Alladina ida asabat hum musiba, kalu inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allah says, those, whenever affliction touches them, afflicts them, whenever hardship afflicts them, whenever calamity and test afflicts them, call who they say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. It says, verily, we came from Allah, it came from Allah, we came from Allah, that one came from Allah, and to Allah we have to return. Everything comes from Allah, and everything has to return to Allah. And normally, you know, we normally recite this dua when we hear somebody pass away. But it's not only for when somebody passed away, anything that is not going our way. We, we lost something, this is the dua that we should recite as well. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. This is the dua for any time affliction comes our way, we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Allah says, Ula'ika alayhim salawatu min rabbim wa rahmah. Allah says, those upon them is the salawat from their Lord. Will be blessings from their Lord wa rahmah and mercy. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمَ الْمُخْتَدُونَ And those, they will be guided. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide them. <coughs> it is mentioned, there are many hadiths talking about istirja. Istirja means to say, إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ so There are many hadiths that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advise us that any time calamities come our way, we should recite this dua. إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَجِعُونَ There is mentioned in a famous hadith about Ummu Salama. Um Salama, once her husband who was Abu Salama, he came to her, she said that he came to me one day and he said that I've learned something from Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that has made me happy. And this word that I've learned from Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he said that no Muslim is faced with any calamity or any affliction. And he says, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And after saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, he says, Allah marjinni fi musibati, li khayran minha. And then after saying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, he says, Oh Allah, reward me in my loss. Reward me in my loss, in my calamity. Waqluf li khayran minha, and oh Allah, give me better than it. Say, so whenever a believer does this at any time of calamity, Allah will definitely give them better. So Ummu Salama, she said she, she memorized that, that dua that Abu Salama had, give, had given to her. And when Abu Salama passed away, when her husband passed away, she did the exact thing. She said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And she recited, Allah marjinni fi musibati wa li khayra minha. Wallah, wallah, reward me in my love and give me better than what you have taken away from me. She said that and she went in her idda period. She stayed by herself to stay for the time of her idda, her waiting period. She said, when my waiting period finished, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came to me. She mentioned his dua before her idda, as soon as she 
called her husband passed away. And after Idda Rasulullah asked for permission to enter. He said at that time I was tanning some skin. I was coloring some skin. And I, I washed my hands and I granted him permission and I placed him to sit. And then Rasulullah he proposed to me. He asked me to marry him. Umar Salama, she said to him, it's not that I do not appreciate or I do not want to get married to you, but I am a woman that is very jealous for him. And I fear because of my jealousy that I have, you might be displeased with me with certain actions I have done, and Allah will punish me. So that is one reason why I really don't want to get married to you. The second thing is that I am old. I am already old already. What do you do with somebody that is old as me? And the third thing she said, I have big children, I have children to take care of, I have children of my own. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, as for that jealousy that you told me about, Allah will remove that from you. I cannot remove that, Allah will remove that from you. And you said that you are old, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I am old as well. You are old, I am old as well, all two of us are old together. And he says, as for your children, your children is my children. I will treat them as they are my children. And he, she accepted the proposal and she got married to Rasulullah And then she said that I have recited, I had recited to Allah, grant me better. She was saying that I could have never, I was thinking to myself that I would have never gotten somebody better than Abu Salama. Because Abu Salama, he was very generous and he was very kind to her. But she says when I got married to Rasulullah I have seen that Allah has surely given me somebody better than Abu Salama. So this is when you recite inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. When calamities come, Allah says recite that. And if you recite that and you hold your patience, Allah will give you better than that. <laughs> it is mentioned from Abi Sanan, he says, I buried a son of mine. Well, a son of mine passed away and I buried him. And while he was, when I placed him in the grave, Abu Salah took me by my hand. And he was walking with me after we have buried him. And he said to me, should I not give you some glass hiding? Because this man, he had just lost his son, just buried his son. He was very sad. He said, should I not give you some glass hiding? He says, definitely. Then he says, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, Malikul Maut, you have taken the son of my servant. You have taken his child. You have taken the son of my servant. You have taken the qurratu aynu. You have taken the comfort of his eyes. You have taken that which was pleasing it to his heart. He says, Kala na'am, Malikul Maut will say, Yes, I have, just, I have just done that because of your permission. He says, Famaba Kala, what did my servant say? When you have taken away his son, that which he loved so much, what did my servant say? And Malikul Maut will say, Hamdaka wa sarja. He praised you and he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibnu lahu baitan fil jannah. Allah will say to Malikul Maud and build for him, I will build for him a house in Jannah because of what he has said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. And like that, there are many other ayats about Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. So when we are in any calamity, we should say that dua, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. As well as the other dua that Abu Salma heard from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Are we good? Allahumma arjirni fi musibati wa khluf li khayra minha. Allahumma arjirni fi musibati wa khluf li khayra minha. Wallah, reward me for my losses wa khluf li khayra minha. And Wallah, give me better than what I've, I've lost, what you have taken away from me. The next ayat we go on to, which is verse 158. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna as-safa wal marwata min sha'ir Allah. فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ وَعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاهَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَسَوَّقَ بِهِمَا وَمَنْ تَتَوَّى خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah speaks about Safa Marwa. As you all know Safa Marwa, we go for Hajj. You also know the story how Safa Marwa came about. With Hajra, she had nothing. She had no milk, no water. Son started to cry running from Safa to Marwa, even though it was in her eyes or it would have looked as impossible for, for her to get any assistance at that time, she did not feel. She did not say, pack up her bags and went, she did not say, I'm just going to relax here and die. 
get whatever heart she was, you know, we at that time, she said, no, I still have to strive, I have to try to make some time, Allah will help me. And she tried to run from Safa Maron. So Allah is teaching us when hardship come to us. Allah is teaching us when hardship come to us, we should also be like Hajra, don't give up. Don't say, no, that is it for me, I'm, I'm closing up. Whatever comes my way, that is it. Be like Hajra, alayhi salam, strive, try to be strong, run. Not run literally, but run, Safa Marwa, like Hajra, try to strive, do not, do not lay back like that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted, granted her relief, the well of Zamzam. And up to today, the well of Zamzam is still there. Safa Marwa, the, the running from one, the, the, the sigh between Safa and Marwa still remains. Still walk from Safa to Marwa. So Allah says, Inna Safa wal Marwa min sha'airillah. Well, Safa and Marwa is from the symbols of Allah. It's from the sha'air and the symbol of Allah. And the word sha'air means... <coughs> That thing that brings about realization and consciousness. Anything that brings about some consciousness in your life, that, that when you see it, you start to reflect, that is known as a sha'ir, a symbol. And Allah is saying that the Safa Mawa are considered to be symbols that when you see it, you should start to reflect on yourself. Look at what Hajra did and look at what I am doing. So whenever we are even doing a sign, we are walking and we are seeing Safa Mawa, that kind of reflection should be in our life as well. Well, where am I? What kind of good deeds I'm doing? He says the uh, Safa Mawa are considered to be the symbols of Allah. Then he says, فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ وَإِتَمَرْ فَلَا جُنَاهَ عَلَيْهِ أَيَّتَّوَّقُ بِهِمَا Whoever performs the Hajj of the house, the pilgrimage of the house, whoever does the Umrah, then there's no sin upon him to make tawaf with them. Allah is saying there's no sin to make tawaf. We know in our way everybody normally makes the, the sai. First Allah says tawaf. Make tawaf of Safa Marwa. Now when we when we understand the term tawaf, all we think about is going around the car, but that is tawaf. And when we do in the Safa Marwa, we call it sai. Sai means to walk. And at certain parts you walk fast and then you walk slow. That is known as sai. But when Allah uses the word tawaf, tawaf does not only mean to go in a circle. Tawaf means to start from somewhere and to end at that same place that is known as Tawaf. And when you're doing the Sai, that is what you do. You start from Safa and you end at Safa. So you start there even though you're walking straight and then you're turning back to go, you, whatever point you started from, you're going to end at that point. That is known as Tawaf. So that's why when you're going around the car, you start from one point and you reach a mark to the point that you started from. You end to the same point that you started. So that is why Allah use the same word for Tawaf even the sai that we do at Safa Marwa. <coughs> now Safa Marwa, Safa Marwa, in the time of Jahiliya, the, the Arabs, they started to, when they, the Safa Marwa, the walk from Safa Marwa was still among their, their way of doing their pilgrimage. They still used to do that. So even though Rasulullah Sallam was not there, they still used to do that. But what they did is that they placed one idol on Safa and they placed another idol on Marwa because they were idol worshippers, even in the Kaaba was idol. So on Safa there was an idol, on Marwa there was an idol. So when they were doing Safa, they, they were walk the, the, from Safa they would walk to Marwa and they would kiss their idol. And then when they finished they would go back to Safa and they would kiss their idol. And this was the, a means of worshipping their idols while they were doing the Sa'i. So when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, and the Hajj, when he was speaking about the Hajj, the ayat were coming out about the Hajj, some of the Ansar and some of the Muslims were hesitating if to still do that. If to still do the Sai walking from Safa to Marwa because the, the people in Jahili used to do the same thing. While they're worshipping their idols, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it to say there's no sin upon you if you do it. Means it is part of the symbols of Hajj. It is a part of what Hajr salam did. And even though the people had corrupted it by placing idols, you could still do it. The idols have been removed. You could still walk from Safa to Marwa, Safa to Marwa. Some of the Sahabas were of the opinion that it meant when Allah says, that there is no sin upon you to make tawaf. Some of them were saying that Allah is saying that there is no sin if you do not make tawaf. When Aisha, she heard that she says that 
I swear by Allah, this is, this is incorrect to say that Allah is saying that if you want to make, if you want to make the sa'i of Safa Mawa, then you could if you want. Because he says, if Allah wants you to do that, Allah would have said, فَلَا جُنَاهَا عَلَيْهِ أَلَّا يَتَوَّقَ بِهِمَا Allah would have put la in front of it, which means, and there's no sin upon you if you do not make tawaf. Allah did not say that. Allah said, there's no sin upon you if you make tawaf. So Allah is telling you, make, go ahead and make tawaf. There's no sin upon you if you make tawaf from the house. <laughs> and it's mentioned that Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to do tawaf there. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a practice from among the sunnah. Shabi, he says, كَانَ إِسَافَ عَلَى الصَّفَى وَكَانَ النَّائِلَ عَلَى الْمَرْوَى Shabi, he says, the idol that was on Safa was named Isaf. And the idol which they had placed on Marwa was known as Na'ila. They had Isaf on Safa and Na'ila on Marwa. And he says that, كَانُوا يَسْتَلِمُونَهُمَا They used to come and used to kiss these idols while they were walking from Safa to Marwa. فَتَخْرُجُوا بَعْدَ الْإِسْنَامِ مِنَ الصَّوَابِ بَيْنَهُمَا And the Sahabas, when they accepted Islam, they, they wanted to stop that action. We stop doing the walk between the Safa and the Marwa. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayat. There's also mention in some Muslim, in a long hadith from Jabir, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he finished the Tawaf of the Kaaba, when he finished going around the Kaaba for his Tawaf, he returned to the black stone and he kissed the black stone. And then he came out from the door that was leading to Safa and he was saying this ayat, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Sha'a and then he says, Abda bima Baba Allah be. Begin from where Allah has begun. Means do implement the action of Sai as how Allah has implemented it by saying, Inna Safa wal Marwata min Sha'a So even from Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he taught us to do the Sai and walking from Safa and Marwa. Abi Tajara, he says, I saw Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam making tawab between Safa and Marwa. And the people was in front of him and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was behind them and he was walking. They were doing the sa'i. And until I saw his knees from the amount of walking that he was doing, I saw his knees and his izar and his clothing was being twisted. Means it was like moving while he was walking so fast. And then he was saying, Is awfa inna Allah kataba alaykum as sa'i. He was saying, before perform the sa'iyu, for verily Allah has prescribed that you perform the sa'i. He says perform the sa'i because Allah has prescribed and Allah has ordained that you perform the sa'i. So from these hadiths, we see that doing the, the, the walking from Safa and Mawa is considered to be a part of the hajj, a rukun and the hajj, that you must do it. And that's where Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Ta'khudu anni manasikakum. Take from me your pilgrimage and your hajj. Look at how I do my hajj and that is how you should do your hajj. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did the sa'i of, of Safa and Marwa, so we should also do, anytime we go for hajj, do the sa'i of Safa and Marwa. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَنْ تَتَوَّعَ خَيْرًا Whoever does optional good deeds. Whoever does optional good deeds. وَمَنْ تَتَوَّعَ تَتَوَّعَ means optional, not fill. Khairan means good things. So man tatawa khairan to do something optional which are good. Some of the opinion, zara fi tawafi bainahuma ala qadr wajib. When Allah says, wa man tatawa khairan, whoever does optional good things means whoever does more tawaf. Not only do that, that amount of tawaf which is compulsory, but any free time you have to do optional tawaf, that will be better for you. Wa man tatawa khairan. That's one opinion. The second opinion is that that you make tawaf between the sa'i that is from Safa and Marwa in Hajj in those Hajj which are optional and those Umrah which are optional. Means not for the third Hajj, but for any time you're going to make an optional Hajj or an optional Umrah, to still do the tawaf from do the sa'i of Safa and Marwa. That is what Allah says, وَمَنْ تَسَوَّعَ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرٌ عَلِيمٌ And lastly, he mentions that it, it refers to all good deeds. Not only about Hajj alone, Allah says, وَمَنْ تَتَوَّعَ خَيْرًا Whoever does optional good deeds, any optional good deeds, do not only rely on fart, do not only rely on those things which are compulsory, but for those وَمَنْ تَتَوَّعَ خَيْرًا Those who do optional good deeds, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمٌ 
Verily, Allah is shakir, Allah is a recognizer, Allah is grateful. Allah, when we say Allah is grateful, it means Allah appreciates those good things that you are doing, and Allah is alim, and Allah is all knowledgeable, Allah knows. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يَظْلِمُوا مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ وَإِن تَكُوا حَسْنَةٌ يُضَائِفُهَا وَإِقْتِمِ اللَّدُونَهُ عَجْرًا عَظِيمٌ Allah says, whatever good things you do, even if those good things which you have done is as small as that of an atom's weight, Allah will not be unjust to you. Allah will not be unjust to you. So all those optional things that you are doing, a smile, to give us a small piece of date, to help out your neighbor, to help somebody with his stick to walk. Allah says, any optional deed, Allah is shakirun alim. Allah will not be unjust to you. Allah will remember it. Allah will put it for you. And that's why in Surah Zazal he says, Whoever does an atom's weight of good, you will see it. Every single small deed that you do, Allah will see it. And to the Qutbah go on, we were mentioning about small things, Allah don't forget. Every single small thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't forget. Because sometimes days, years may pass, and Allah will help you out of certain situations because of that small deed that you did. So whatever good deed you do, with optional, Allah will be there and Allah will remember it. Allah will reward you for it. And it is, وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِسْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ شَرَّ يَرَى as well. Whoever does an utterance with of evil, Allah will, he will see it. وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِسْقَالَ ذَرَةٍ شَرَّ يَرَى He will be able to see it. So when we go on that day, everything we will see, all our good deeds. Basically, if it's just a two rakat sunnah that we pray it, we will see it. Basically, if it's just a one dollar charity that we give, we will see it. Basically, if it's just a little assistance, assisting somebody good, we will see it. If it's any evil thing that we do and we did not repent, we will see it as well. If we repent and Allah forgives it, Allah could wipe it out first. But if we do not repent, every single small thing that Allah did not forgive, we will see it as well. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ تَتَوَى خَيْرًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَاكِرًا عَلِيمٌ And whoever does anything optional, good thing, Allah is shakiran, Allah, Allah, Allah will appreciate it. Allah is shakir. The word shakir, even though shakir means to be grateful, it's not that Allah will be grateful to you. It's that Allah will appreciate and Allah will, be, Allah will always be by your side to help you. Because Allah will see that you are trying to do good things. You are trying to do optional good deeds. Because Allah knows He has not made it compulsory. He's talking about optional deeds. Allah has not made it compulsory. And Allah is saying, even though it's not compulsory, you are still striving for things which are not compulsory. Allah will very much appreciate that and Allah is all knowing. Allah says Al Alim. Allah is the all knowing and Allah will record it for So with that inshallah we end tonight's class. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashru ala ilaha ila anta, nastakbruka wa natubi ilaik. Subhanallah rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifu wa salaman ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen.